Kitty Scattergood, uh, the daughter of the famous Chicago millionaire, uh, Mr. Scattergood, uh, she is she refuses to get married until she has made her mark as an anthropologist. Uh, and the only way she can do that is by finding the last savage man. And of course, that last savage man doesn't exist. So the parents of the man uh, she's meant to marry, Prince Kodanda, they've all gotten together and they have gotten uh, this poor Abdul, this fella who lives down the road who's dating one of the palace staff. They've gotten him to dress up like Tarzan and pretend to be a savage. And once he's been captured during Act One and brought back in great triumph with pomp and circumstance in a cage. Uh, he's left in the cage while everyone else goes in to have a feast. Uh, and while he's in this cage, he sings about what he's given up for the love of Sardula. And he's sung, you know, he really introduces one of the most important themes of the piece, which is, what am I giving up for love? You know, money isn't important to me. What I love are, you know, uh, is nature. I love the my streams and fields and, and you know, uh, I've given all that up for, for what? For a few pennies. Minotti was so influenced by film and television and Hollywood, you know, he references it. Uh, and because the piece was set in, in its own time, it was set in the time it was written, in the 60s, uh, I think I have been looking a lot at the films of the time to get a sense of them. And I think this, this one Rock Hudson Doris Day film, Lover Come Back, is kind of my go-to piece. When I, when I talk to the singers about tone and feel, I tell them to go look at that, and I tell them to then go and rent a movie called Down With Love, which is a more recent movie, which is kind of a, a, a modern gloss, an homage to those movies. He's also along the way able to poke fun at civilization and society in a way that is occasionally pretty pungent. You know, in, in this party scene, when Abdul is introduced to civilization, he has his coming out party in a way, and Kitty is gonna show him off and show that she's taught him how to use a knife and a fork and how to read a newspaper and how to use a television remote control and all of these things, you know, so it's, he's gonna be her great triumph for, you know, her Eliza Doolittle. Uh, so she's going to reveal him to the world. So when I try to explain to my friends what I love about The Last Savage, I tell them, imagine if Donizetti and Puccini got together and they wrote a score based on a Doris Day Rock Hudson comedy. Uh, in this case, in particular, Lover Come Back, which is the one that I, I keep going back to over and over again when I work on this piece. Uh, and they first they look at me a little puzzled, and then they start laughing out loud, and then they say, where can I buy a ticket? Um, and that's really the closest that I can come to describing the tone of it, the, f the, the overall vibe. You know, the opera was premiered in the same year as Lover Come Back. A lot of the themes about, you know, the role of women and the role of marriage and what does it mean to be in love and what does it mean to be married and can you actually be in love and be married at the same time and what does all that mean? All of those same fascinations that the pop culture had in the early 60s, uh, those are the fascinations of this piece. Those are the things that, that Puccini is, or whoa, that Minotti is playing with and satirizing and, you know, having fun with. One of the things I love about the piece is that it's incredibly well crafted. You know, musically it's well crafted. He was a real man of the theater. Uh, he knew what he was doing. So there are things that there are gags. As I was describing the plot to someone, I started talking about one of the plot points and then I realized, no, you know, it's tangential. You don't need to know it to, to really understand the piece, but it's something that's set up very early on, and then as the opera progresses, it sort of gets called back to in, in you know very minor ways, and then it ends up being this huge major reveal and plot point late in the opera that really changes the entire outcome. And to be able to craft that, to be able to weave that in in that way, uh, I think is brilliant. And I think that you know his musical writing style. Again, it's that you know that Donizetti meets Puccini thing, where you have wonderful, tuneful melodies, uh, but then you also have this incredibly light, funny, almost Offenbach quality comedy. Where you know my favorite line in the entire opera is uh, Kitty Scattergood, who's the female lead, uh, who's an anthropologist. When she's found the last savage, when she's you know uh, finally fulfilled her great professional goal, which is to find the last savage man alive. Uh, when she's finally done that, she sings, no anthropologist is greater than I, with all these wonderful trills, you know, Olympia-style trills and runs and everything. And it's just so wonderfully silly. It's so delightfully wacky that uh, when, you, when you balance that out with the emotion and the feeling, and, you know, there's a wonderful ensemble in Act Three where everyone just stops and says, 
look how fortune can surprise you. Look what can happen when you're not expecting. You know, life doesn't turn out the way you want it to, but somehow it all turns out okay. It's a very sophisticated and, you know, it's one of those places where that little bit of melancholy is just threaded through that ability to sit back and look at your life and, and look at what's happened and embrace it. it. It boggles my mind that this piece is not performed more than it is. It's one of those things that I just do not understand uh, because it has all the elements that you want. It has, you know, it has the comedy, it has the romance, it has the drama, it has beautiful singing, it has, uh, you know, it has an act two finale, which is probably the most complex thing I've ever even thought about staging. There is something about being here, and I don't know if it's the sort of the beauty of the surroundings. I don't know if it's the, the fact that you feel like you're in this kind of magical place. Maybe it's the lack of oxygen going to my brain. Maybe it's some combination of all those things. Uh, but it feels like a place that exists only to create great art.